sort of talk about sort of medical stuff, medical image analysis that we're doing. So we've got about five, six people or something like that who are actually interested in looking at medical application areas. And we try to assist radiologists in, or clinical people in better understanding of the medical data that you're looking at. Um, most of it is image-based, but not all of it is. Um, we actually do other bits and bits as well, where we basically get data streams, sort of breath information, or whatever people have actually measured at a certain point, and see if we can actually provide better analysis than they would actually provide themselves, or a second opinion. A lot of the image analysis work that we actually do is providing a second opinion to uh, a clinical person. So they will actually look at the Im image information in the first instance themselves, then they will actually look at what the computer actually thinks about it, and specifically we're looking at sort of mammographic abnormalities that's actually come a long way in the past, probably 10 years or something like that, to the effect that there are actually commercial packages on the market now which are used to actually provide second opinions to radiologists. So, good thing. Um, sort of, can you all see that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> good. So, I was actually doing the talk in China, and they had difficulty recognizing that one. Not that a dose, but they. It reminds me of home with Simpson, actually. So, um. It is. So, this is part of your education. Um. 1.4. So, what are we looking at? We're interested in cancer, yeah? So, that one might be easier. Yeah? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, any guesses? That's a breast. That's a breast, so that's an x ray of a breast. Um, that one might be easier as well. Brain. Uh, brain. brain, yeah. So, it's, I think it's actually MRI of a brain or something like MRI with modality. Um, and that one. Oh, is that, is, oh, that's um, ovary, isn't it? Like a pelvic. It's a pelvic size, yeah. yeah. So, but wrong sex. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> oh, it's actually <laughs> real. Um, we actually do quite a bit of prostate work as well. So, and the prostate is sitting somewhere over there. So, we're doing. Well, I started off doing that a long time ago, and we've been doing that for ten years. And that actually covers the whole population. Yeah. Um, I won't go into that. <laughs> I think you understand. Um, more recently, we've actually so we've actually done smaller projects as well. We actually do bits of brain work, and we do bits of lung work and things like that. So we sort of cover a broad spectrum of of sort of application areas. We're interested in sort of developing what we call generic techniques, and then apply them somewhere. And we might actually apply them to a number of different fields and see if they're actually doing things there. So. Um, are we aiming for? So I'm actually using a previous presentation, so I'm sure you're not interested in who I collaborate with, um, but you might be interested in this. So, um, so a CAT system is a computer-aided diagnosis system, yeah? and how that might work. So these are actually artificial images, and can you spot anything that actually looks like a small set of blobs? Screen should be good enough for that. <laughs> no, yes, no. <coughs> so, if you actually had a system that actually said you might want to pay attention there, yeah. 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 Oh, right. yeah. then a radiologist would say, Oh, yes, there might be something there, and I might actually further investigate that. Yeah. So, this would be almost an ideal system because there is actually a sort of small cluster of blocks there. Um, some of the early CAT systems did. Well, no, this is more recent CAT system would we'll do that as well. There's nothing wrong there, but it would still indicate that the computer thinks there's something wrong. And really early CAT systems actually did things like that. And that's completely not useful. We actually did studies <laughs> studies as well. Where we, yes, so we point out everything and yes, you actually capture the abnormality as well, which is good, but we actually look at lots of other things. Um, if you actually present radiologists with things like this, it might actually be detrimental to their work workflow certainly because it will take them longer but they might also miss that and they certainly won't trust the system so there's a trust issue involved as well um, so we're actually aiming for something like that and that would be ideal we've never achieved that yeah? <laughs> nobody in the commercial world actually or in the research world certainly not for clinical applications like mammography or prostate cancer have achieved that um, 
but we actually get, at the moment, we get very close, certainly for some abnormalities. Um, we've got um, mammography work where we detect, I think, 95% of the abnormalities, mm. and we only sort of get one false positive per 100 images, which is actually really, really good. So How does that compare to humans doing the same job? Um, humans actually, it's as good as a human is. So okay. it's a good, um, some of the microcalc, so microcalc is basically a small cluster of other number, um, small bright blobs. Um, for that, a computer is as good as, um, I think they actually looked at radiologists with 10 years of experience or something like that. Would this speed up the diagnosis as well? Yes. In, to be ideal. So um, advantages are as well that if you actually combine this with doing biopsies and things like that, mm. then you actually know where to actually go and stuff like that. Mm. Yeah, so that helps as well. What's, um, what's only starting at the moment, so this is only doing detection. Yeah? So this is only pointing out there might be something wrong there. It's not saying if it's benign or malignant. Yeah? And that's actually the next step that we're actually working on at the moment, or all the people in the world are working on at the moment as well. So actually moving away that you actually need to do a biopsy would be a good thing. don't know if we actually ever get there, because we actually would need to do clinical trials and stuff like that. But So that's actually stuff we're aiming for. Otherwise, <laughs> you're not interested in that. I, I actually decide today what you're interested in. And <laughs> <laughs> um, clearly, if you've got questions, then I'll ask them, yeah. Um, so I think on there I've got four case studies. and So you've seen this before, so we're actually looking at um, prostate cancer, we're actually looking at different sort of aspects of it. We first want to find the prostate in the images, and then we actually want to say something about the internal structure of the prostate. Is there cancer there? And from a prostate point of view, it's important to actually know if the cancer is actually confined to the prostate, or if it's actually sort of spread outside the prostate area, because that actually determines sort of different process for the patient. If it's confined within the prostate and the patient is okay and stuff like that, then they will actually remove the whole prostate. Yeah, and clearly, but that's that's not an option if it's actually spread outside the prostate already. Yeah, so from a staging point of view, that actually means that you actually get different treatment and stuff like that. Um, if it's spread outside, they will actually do radiotherapy and chemotherapy and stuff like that. So that would be an ideal world for us because that's actually been done by one of our radiologists and so he actually annotated us. Um, we've got Matt, a collaborating radiologist who will actually sit down for hours on and sort of outlining different things for us, which is good because we wouldn't be able to do anything without. So this is um, sort of the internal structure of the prostate, um, there's a central zone and the white bits are actually abnormalities or is, is a cancer and you can actually see that in this case it's actually spread outside. Yeah? So we've actually done some modeling and stuff like that, so blah, blah, blah. that would be ideal. Um, so this is, I think this is actually automatic detection. Mm -hmm. yeah, um, so this is manual outlined, and what we're actually aiming for is, can we actually do something automatic that will actually find that as well? And we can actually do that quite easily. We can actually sort of find the shape of the prostate automatically in, a, in about 98% of the cases. There are a few sort of cases where the, um, so the prostate is actually can be very large, normal size for a healthy male is sort of don't, um, walnut size, but you can actually get, if you get to elderly stages, then it can actually be almost um, orange size or something like that. So, and the extremes of that we actually can't capture all of the time because um, most of our detection methods are actually based on sort of statistical approaches, so it needs to see enough examples of certain cases to be able to detect them. So if we had enough examples of really large ones as well, then at a certain point we believe that we would actually see those as well. Yeah. Um, the other thing is that, so in this case we've got automatic methods that actually detect where it thinks bits are wrong on the boundary, indicated by red, and it's a mute point because this, that was annotated by the radiologist, yeah, so that was fine, it actually, and this is what we actually detected ourselves, and that's fine, but we actually had sort of small blips on the sides as well. We don't know, and the radiologists don't know either, if that's actually beginnings of cancer there, that it's actually been detected, 
So we could actually remove those easily, but are you actually then removing the information that you might actually need at a certain point? So um, we haven't done clinical trials on them, and hopefully I never have to do any clinical trials mm -hmm. ever again. <laughs> <laughs> Paperwork is horrendous. Um, so, question. Spotty abnormality. Right, and this down the bottom. That one over there? Yeah. 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 You're an expert, Rick. <laughs> <laughs> Um, most of them are not that simple, so this is actually for display purposes. <laughs> <laughs> um, we've actually, so, if I, so this is, if I look in mammography, then there's sort of different types of abnormalities. So when they all are represented differently, this is speculated lesion, and it's effectively, it's got a sort of central white area, and it's got sort of tentacles coming out of it, radiating out of it, so um, that is... Um, it's one of the abnormalities that's about, I think, 85% of them are actually malignant. So we actually want to detect all of them. And the ones that are actually not malignant, we actually biopsy as well. So from that point of view, detection is important. And we've actually, so this is work that we did maybe 10 years ago or something like that. And we actually looked at sort of radiating patterns. Can you actually detect that? And we've developed methods for that. So we actually, so this is a radiating pattern made by myself. Yeah? So <laughs> clearly you can see that it is a radiating pattern. Um, can you still see it's a radiating pattern while we actually corrupted it a bit? So we added some noise, yeah? So it's, it's slightly more difficult to see. And then what we actually did after that was we actually we developed a method to actually remove noise from patterns like that. So there was some prior information. We're looking for sort of star shaped patterns and stuff like that. And can we actually do that? And that is sort of reconstructed or noise removed aspect of it. And hopefully what you can see is it's not ideal, yeah, but it actually has coped quite well with noise aspects. And you can actually see again that there is a radiating pattern, sort of central area is slightly larger here, but um, in the clinical data that tends to be the case as well. So when we actually apply that to cases like that, and then you get a probability map where you can actually see where it thinks that different areas are. In this case, there's quite a few sort of, if I threshold, do you know what thresholding is? So thresholding is, a, if I have that image, I've got sort of, um, I can have different levels. It's a probability image, so all the values are in between 0 and 1. Yeah, But I can actually say that 0.5, I'm only interested in things above 0.5, indicating that there might be an abnormality. If you do that for this image, yeah, then you actually find far, quite a few false positives because it will actually point to that point over there and that one over there. It will point to that one over there as well and probably that one. Yeah. If I set my threshold slightly higher, so I actually start removing false positives at that stage, yeah, I can actually threshold certainly that image at a stage where it will only have that one left. And we did it on a large data set and that would actually give us 95% sort of detection rate and very low false positives. So we can actually threshold all data set at one level and then actually get good results for that. So, and that's actually helping radiology. About 10 minutes. Um, Mammograph registration, we actually did um, a project where we looked um, at registration between different modalities. So, in mammography, if you're above the age of 50, then you will actually be invited to actually get your mammograms done. Yeah? So everybody's invited every two or three years. Um, some abnormalities, and certainly for younger women, are not actually visible on normal x-rays because the breast is too dense or other things are actually sort of obscuring the abnormalities. And in that case, um, women might actually get MRI imaging from the breast as well. And you can actually see certain things in MRI that you can't see in in normal x-rays. Um, reason why not everybody is getting MRIs is because it's expensive, mm -hmm. it takes a huge amount of time. A normal radio screening mammography radiologist will look at, I think, about, at about 250 cases in an hour normal mammography. It's really, it will actually sort of, they call rotators or rollators and they will actually have so has there been, than I Has there been a study where you know, because you see, like it's under fifteen hour that there is a higher percentage of mistakes happening. Then um, there have been studies about that, and if you get expert radiology, they actually get quite a bit of training, and it's on the job training. Mm. What we're actually looking for is abnormal things that actually are not normal, and yes, they miss stuff, 
but they miss very few. And um, in the UK, within mammography screening programs, everything is double red. So two radiologists will look oh, yeah. at it. If both of them actually say, that's okay, nobody will ever look at it again, hmm. unless in five years' time or in three years' time they actually find an abnormality, they will actually go back to that again. Um, if one of them actually says there's something wrong with it, yeah, then they will actually review cases. If clearly, if both of them say there's something wrong, then they will review cases as well. Yeah. So there's a double reading process as well. So one of the questions that we are actually trying to answer is, can instead of actually using two radiologists, can we use one radiologist and a computer? Hmm. And there's been some studies certainly on sort of clusters of small jobs <coughs> and stuff like that, that a radiologist and a computer will do as well as two radiologists. But hmm. there's no perfect system. No. Yeah. Um, I won't say something because you were actually recording stuff. But okay. <laughs> 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 if you turn it off at the end, I'll actually tell you. <laughs> 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 um, so we're actually interested in how we can actually sort of use two modalities, two different images, to actually put them together and get additional information. Um, the reason why we're interested in MRI, MRI and X-ray is because biopsies are actually done under X-ray. Yeah, so it's actually done live. You get a live image, X-ray image, and you can actually see the needle going into the breast and stuff like that, and then they take it. But if on the X-ray you actually can't see the abnormality, which was visible on the MRI, then you need some reference frame. So we actually come up with methods that actually um, do the, um, the registration between the two modalities and actually then be able to actually see live um, on the X-ray image the deformed um, MRI data as well. And you can actually then prod your needle into a direction and actually take samples from the right area. Because there has been cases in the past as well where women actually in their blood, it was actually clear that they had cancer but you would never be able to find it on the uh, on the x-rays. So when, in that case, you can go for biopsy. Um, if all the cells are normal and you're still indicating your blood that you actually have cancer there, then they will actually send you for another biopsy mm. until they actually find it. So it's not a good process. So we actually did work on that. Um, so these are actually just x-rays and they're actually changes over time and hopefully you can actually see that they're actually sort of brighter areas over there. So the other thing that we're interested in is can we actually see in that case, and in that case, if there's a beginning of an abnormality in the same area, and then you will actually, there might be something there already, but is that visible as well? And they did larger studies in the Netherlands where they actually looked back sort of three years, six years, and sort of re-evaluated cases. Can we actually see things? And there are data sets where it's, it's sort of early signs of cancer, and we're actually using those to actually do or sort of develop our um, algorithms on to actually see if we can actually do early detection of cancer and stuff like that. Um, this is sort of a close-up of the relevant areas, sort of looking at the same space or registered space. So, and yes, there might be some beginnings there. That would be very difficult for most radiologists to actually detect at that early, very early stage. But there might be some. So, can we think like that? Uh, that's boring. <laughs> um, what we've over the last probably five, six years or something like that, what we've actually moved into as well is we actually instead of actually looking for specific abnormalities, one of the things that's sort of a hot topic is for us is to actually look at can we predict which women are actually will develop breast cancer. Yeah, so they haven't got breast cancer and it's related to previous slides where you actually look at early signs of cancer and stuff like that. So we're not then interested anymore in abnormalities in the, at that stage, but um, from the image information, and there's been sort of clinical trials using visual assessment that um, experts have actually looked at whole cohorts of women, and depending on um, the sort of density of the breast and the patterns that are actually there in there, sort of the the ductal patterns and the density patterns that are in there, you can actually have a higher risk of developing breast cancer. And breast screening programs actually want to use information like that because they might actually want to invite <coughs> those women with higher risk um, every year or something like that. Mm -hmm. While if you're actually really low risk, if you've got very uh, fatty breast, um, then you might actually be invited every four years yeah, instead of every two years. So that's basically why you actually want to do things like that. So. Uh, decided that that's boring. So a 
effectively we're actually looking at things like this and trying to detect <coughs> sort of not only the intensity of the images, yeah, because that's fairly simple for us to do, but also the patterns that are sort of in the breast. So there's sort of more um, fine texture in that area, stuff like that, and in that area. And we're trying to distinguish that as well. So this would be a woman with a low risk of developing breast cancer, while the one over there would probably, I think, for this study, it was probably 20 times more likely to develop breast cancer than that one over there. So if we did more intensive screening of, for instance, those two categories of women, then you would be able to actually detect abnormalities earlier, and that would be beneficial because then your mortality rate would actually go down. Assume there's actually segmentation results after that. So we've actually come up with specific methods to actually look at these images <coughs> and do classification of the different regions in there. Um, in this case, I've got four classes there, and they're representing real sort of tissue information that is related to anatomical information. And we can actually use that. This must be one of the good cases. I don't know what's next. Oh, that's boring. <laughs> <laughs> and up here, that's it. One minute. Okay. Mm. okay. Basic information about sort of questions, more philosophical questions about sort of cat systems and stuff like that. Sorry. Uh,